When the Night Comes Out presents The Hive, Part 10. This is Warden Michael Kettinger speaking to you from my office in the administration building. I'm speaking to you now because we have little time and a serious crisis on our hands. A virus of some sort has begun to spread among the prisoners and hospital staff. The virus acts quickly and seems to turn each individual into mindless savages who attack any living thing that happens to be nearby. They will tear apart and devour some individuals, but some they just bite, and a single bite causes the infection to spread. Mike stopped at that point and looked down at his desk. The unreality of the situation washed over him. He was losing control of the hive. He could feel it slipping through his fingers. I must stress to everyone in the hive and hive city that this is the most dangerous of situations. Already numerous deaths have occurred and the entire medical wing of the prison has been sealed off. The creatures, ghouls, whatever they are, seem to be able to travel via the air vents, and it's for that reason I'm calling for the orderly evacuation of the entire prison population of the hive. With the air vents in each cell, it has become evident that it will be impossible to seal off the cells enough to protect everyone. There was almost a palpable shift in the mood of the entire prison. He could feel the tension within the administration building. He knew that his voice was booming like God, from high within the walls of the cave from which Hive City had been dug. He could imagine mothers clutching at children, and wives sitting down at kitchen tables and wondering if they would see loved ones again. The Hive prison has been sealed off from Hive City. No one will be allowed in or out. All of the prisoners are to please proceed in an orderly fashion to the administration building. Accommodations will be made in the gymnasium. Gentlemen, I must stress to you how important it is that you do proceed in an orderly fashion. Kettinger clicked off the mic for a moment and cleared his throat. We are no longer guards and prisoners. We are no longer administrative staff and criminals. We are in this together. If we cannot cooperate in this matter, band together to fight this threat, we will lose the hive. We are miles below ground. There's no help coming. We have to do this ourselves. And now the final thing that had to come. The threat. Anyone who does attempt to cause trouble, avenge a grudge, or do anything other than proceed orderly to the administration building will be shot. No questions asked. There will be no warnings, save for this one given. You will be shot immediately. Please, do not make this necessary. Kettinger shut off the mic. He looked up at Dalton King, the last person he ever expected to see in his office. King was staring at the banks of monitors along the wall. Standing in the doorway, her hand clutched at her throat, was Jenny. She looked pale and terrified. Reg was in the office as well, staring out at the hive from the giant window. Reg, please instruct your guards to make this happen as fast as possible, Kenninger said quietly. There was no need to shout. Everyone knew how critical this was and how incredibly dangerous. Reg said nothing, his face like stone, suppressing whatever fear he might have had, and walked out the door. Jenny, Kettinger said, get as many people as you can to volunteer down to the gymnasium. We need help getting cots set up. Kettinger looked up into her fearful eyes. She said nothing in protest, but gave a short nod of her head. Then she vanished back down the hall. Kettinger could see others in the office and hallway beyond his office, and he could feel the eyes boring into him. They were scared, he reminded himself. Most of them had no real idea what these things looked like or what they could do. They were more terrified of the prisoners than they were of the demons that inhabited the bowels of the hive. Thank you. It was King who said that. What does it matter to you? Kettinger asked, sitting down in his chair. It's not like these are your people. Those people who followed you are on the surface. King turned away from the monitors and faced Kettinger. The prisoners around the world are my people, Michael. You should know that. Who do you think most of my followers are? Former prisoners in many cases, but also many who just felt that life had made them prisoners. 
And if you think that communication cannot go forth within the walls of the hive, despite your best precautions, then you are truly delusional. King pointed to the window, toward the hive. That place is as much mine as it is yours, Michael. He finished. He strode over to Kettinger's desk and then leaned down, his hands on the surface. We need a plan now, King said. What are you thinking? We have them trapped, Kettinger said. I don't know a thing about making bombs or something that can wipe out potentially hundreds of creatures at once. That's why I brought you here. Let's face it, Dalton. You were the most prolific mass murderer in quite some time. King smiled. And here I thought it was my charming company and personality. Of course, Michael. I understand. But I need to know what we're dealing with. If these things, as you say, die when the virus hits, but then reanimate, then chemical weapons will not work. We're faced with the very real possibility of destroying, probably on a permanent basis, a large section of the hive. Kettinger sat forward, his head spinning. He hadn't thought about that. Some part of him had assumed he would shut off the air or spread some kind of poison, like wiping out insects. If they were already dead, however, they were not breathing, and that meant that this avenue was gone. Kettinger was not used to dealing with the undead. Who was? What do you need to do something like that? Kettinger said. I need to know the layout of that entire wing, and I will need access to chemicals, fertilizer, perhaps other things. King said. I regret to inform you, Michael, but I am going to need to see plans of the hive. You may have bargained with the devil to an even greater degree than you realize. Kettinger felt a sinking in his stomach. When was the last time he had eaten? His brain was scattered. Too much to process. The phone on his desk rang. <coughs> Kettinger picked it up. Kettinger, he said. This is Kettinger. Who is this? Q. The voice hissed at the other end. Kettinger felt cold ice envelop his heart. Q? Yes. Q, what's wrong with your voice? Kettinger said, his mouth dry. Guess who got bit? <laughs> Q, is that you? What are you doing? What are you saying? Kettinger knew he was basically babbling, but despite all that had happened so far, he had not felt true and utter fear until he heard the voice. I got bit. The voice that claimed to be Q hissed. It was unlike anything that Kettinger had heard before, and it was certainly unlike Q. It was like gravel stuck in someone's throat. It hissed and vibrated like bees in a hive. The voice said, still holding out the vowels like notes in a song. Evolving fast, we all think together. A hive, a true hive. Q, please, if this is some kind of joke. Kettinger's own voice no longer sounded like anything he recognized. His breath wheezed in and out of his chest. Dalton King walked over to the desk. He studied Kettinger's face for a moment, cocking his head to the left and right as if studying him, his brow furrowed. Then he leaned forward and hit the speaker button on the phone. Taylor, Mike, with each person, they capture with their bite. Their mind grows. They learn from each person. Why are you calling us then? This time it was King speaking. Hello, Dalton. I thought you might be there. Why are you calling us? What do you want? To inform you. Don't fight. Don't resist. It is a futile effort. We grow. We hunger. We were here long before humanity. And humanity feared us for centuries. Buried down here for so long, like others of us, 
now set free. We must return to where we were. We must return to the surface. Humanity will fear us again. Many will become one of us. Many more will die, but not all. Some will remain. They must. They will be bred, and they will serve us. They will be a vital resource for us. Kettinger and King sat there listening to this long, rambling, hissing monologue. Kettinger felt as if ice were in his veins. He knew what the thing that had been his most trusted advisor was talking about, but he needed to hear him say it. What purpose? Kettinger said. There was a strange noise. At first, Kettinger could not place what it was, and then realized that the thing that wore Q's flesh was laughing. Food. Then the line went dead. Get the prisoners out, King said, and fear crossed his face. Kettinger had never seen the man afraid. Get them out fast. Kettinger bolted from the room. He heard King right behind him. Kettinger saw the faces of the people who worked in the cubicles on all sides of him. They were terrified and pale, and they all looked half dead already. All of these people were his responsibility, but things were getting much worse. He was losing control. He had once had a name. He had once been an individual. Now, he was one of many. He no longer breathed. He no longer truly thought on his own. He had been known as Q, but now he was part of the many. He could feel his skin rotting on his flesh. His heart no longer beat. The world looked red, and everywhere he looked, he wanted to tear something apart. Tear into soft, hot flesh and feel the blood as it spurted down his throat. So many of them were meat. Only the few could really become part of them. They stood in the hall and stared at him. Their faces were slack or twisted into snarls. Q ran his tongue over the teeth that somehow had transformed into a mouthful of needles and knives. Perfect for rending flesh. Q walked past them, knowing they would follow. It was hard to think. The Q had been chosen for a reason. He was chosen because his mind was strong, and they wanted the knowledge that was in his mind. Knowledge about the hive. Knowledge of how to get out without air shafts. Q walked down the hall, past the empty cells. The dozens of others followed, some of them groaning and moaning, but most of them silent. They did not shamble. They might have been a group walking in a mall, save for the blood and scraps of flesh that clung to their clothing. Food was coming. So much food. They were going for the big door that had come down and shut them off. Food was on the other side. Q could get them to it. Reg and his crew had managed to get a large portion of the rest of the prison moving, but the prisoners were clogging the hallway. They moved slowly, their eyes filled with fear. Kettinger arrived and grabbed a megaphone. Please move urgently, he said. He did not want to start a panic, but he was close to panicking himself. We need to get you to the gymnasium as quickly as we can. Vacant eyes looked at him, but the flow of the prisoners did not get much faster. There were just too many of them. The hallways were not built for this kind of mass exodus. Kettinger looked to his left at Dalton King. His eyes conveyed the urgency. King grabbed the megaphone. Please, my brothers, King said. Almost immediately, the throng of prisoners stopped. Do not stop. Keep moving and move fast. Help your brothers. We have little time, and if we do not get the entire population in the gym soon, many more will die. His voice galvanized them. They began to move faster, many of them suddenly taking leadership roles, guiding and directing them. No one fought. They moved with purpose and urgency now. 
One by one, the cell doors opened and more prisoners joined the group. None of them thought. Kettinger felt a moment of fear at seeing this many of the prisoners in one place, fearing a riot at any moment, but that did not happen. It was as if they too had become like a hive mind. They all seemed to know the danger. They had all been locked in their cells, but they all knew that something terrible had happened. Kettinger pushed the button on his communication device. Jenny, come in. A moment passed. It felt like a thousand years. Go, Mike. Jenny said. How are things at the gym? Some of the first prisoners are already arriving. It's all very orderly. Most of them are helping us put up more cots and get things set. Okay, keep it going. I think most of them understand that this is not a time for foolishness. Do you have guards with you? Yes, Matthew and Billy are here. Tell them they are authorized to shoot first and ask questions later. Roger. Jenny said, and then the communication went quiet. Kettinger made his way to the back of the line of prisoners. Reg was there, looking tired, but determined. His gun was in his hand, ready for action at a moment's notice, but it was also by his side to hopefully not freak someone out. They seem to get that this is serious, boss, Reg said. I've never seen them this quiet, not even when they go on their shift. I can tell. They're scared, and they have every right to be. We'll keep them moving, but we need to move fast. They got Q. Kettinger said. Reg's face registered the fear, doubt, and anger that Kettinger had felt and was still feeling. He says that when someone gets bit and becomes one of their number, their knowledge and mind becomes part of their hive mind. Yes, those things think. They can plan. Kettinger knew he was close to babbling again, but he didn't care. If Q is part of their number, they now have full knowledge of the hive. Reg nodded at this, but said nothing. He appeared to be thinking this over. A man of action, but also a ponderer. Suddenly, the air was filled with rumbling noises mixed with a metallic screeching sound. The floor vibrated. Reg looked at Kettinger. Kettinger stared back and then looked at King. That's the door, Kettinger said. Dalton King licked his lips. We're out of time, gentlemen. The sound of the metal door went on and on. It was so loud, Kettinger thought his head might explode before it stopped. Almost as soon as it began, another sound began to fill in the moments of silence. A horrific screeching sound that was obviously not just one creature, but dozens. They sounded angry, they sounded inhuman, and they somehow managed to sound hungry. We gotta move, Reg said. Everyone run, move, move, move. Everyone with a gun, get back here. Set up a firing line. Kettinger looked at Dalton King, but King was already trying to push the prisoners along, taking charge, motivating them. Kettinger looked back, behind himself, and he could see shadows and shapes, things leaping and diving and jumping into the air, climbing over each other. Then they came around the corner, and Kettinger felt his breath catch in his throat. This was the first time he had seen them in person. There were dozens, and most of them were people he knew. There was Carol, one of the nurses. There was Frank, one of the guards. And finally, most devastating of all, there was Q. At the front of the pack, his mouth open, the pointed teeth on display like some kind of walking shark. They ran with a speed that baffled Kettinger. They were climbing over each other, around each other, their arms outstretched, their fingers bent into ragged claws. Their mouths were open, and they made the screeching sound over and over and over again. As Kettinger watched, two of them broke off, their hands grasping at the wall, and they began to climb, now like some sort of human-shaped spiders, climbing the walls, scrambling over the rock, moving on all fours. Jesus, Kettinger whispered. Reg and his men began firing. They took careful aim, knocking the two off the wall first, and then taking out more of them in the pack. The guards formed a line, and they took the brunt of the attack first. The pack of ghouls reached the guards and yanked the guns away, then pulled the guards one by one into the horde. Kettinger could hear them screaming as the sound of rending flesh, breaking bone also filled the air. He could smell the blood as it spurted, feel it spray as a fine mist across his face. 
Hedinger whirled his own gun in his hand and took aim at Q. Q saw him, hissed, and then ducked. The bullet went over Q's head, but caught one of the prisoner ghouls in the neck. The prisoner bobbled in its footsteps and then went down, but was soon scrambling to its feet and running again just as fast as before. Kettinger took careful aim and hit him in the head, and the prisoner went down for good. Q was still coming on strong. It was no use. The throngs of prisoners were just moving too slowly. Kettinger fired and fired, but several of the ghouls rushed past him, and he heard screams from behind him now. He had lost sight of Reg, of Dalton King. Jesus, what would these things be able to do if they had Dalton King's mind added to their collective? Kettinger turned back the other way, trying to find King. He couldn't see Dalton, but he could see the ghouls as they leapt into the air, scrambled up the walls, leapt off the walls, and landed amidst the prisoners. There was more screaming, more rending flesh and muscle, and more breaking bones. Blood ran down the floor. Kettinger kept moving. It was beyond his ability to think of anything more than his own survival at this point. He reloaded his gun and began firing again and again. He aimed as carefully as he could, firing into their heads. One of them grabbed his arm as he was aiming at another scrambling up the wall. He saw movement out of the corner of his eye and then a grip like a vice latched onto his arm. The shot went wild and then he saw the rotted flesh leaning in to bite him. Kettinger kicked out with his left foot and caught the former guard, Tim. This guy's name was Tim in the knee. The knee gave way and the leg bent back. This sent it off balance, and Kettinger yanked his arm out of the strong grip. Kettinger staggered back, aimed his gun, fired a bullet into the thing's head. The guard, formerly known as Tim, was down. Something leapt onto Kettinger's back. Hands grabbed at his throat. He heard the teeth clacking together against his right ear. He could not move his arms and waited for the pain of the teeth sinking into his neck, his shoulder. It wouldn't matter where he was bitten. If he was bitten anywhere, he was a goner. Then the head of the ghoul on his back exploded into ropey strands of brains and materials that used to think. The head fell to the ground, blown to pieces, and the body fell right after it. Kettinger caught a glimpse of Reg, turning away from his direction, facing back against the horde. Up ahead, the throng of prisoners kept moving, but more and more were being bitten. Kenninger saw limbs, fingers, eyes, hair flying into the air. More than anything, he saw blood. Those that were bitten instead of devoured quickly turned, adding to their numbers. The hallway was filled with a mass of humanity and demons, the floor slicked with blood and bits of flesh. Kenninger just fired and fired. He reloaded and did it all over again. Anything that looked at him and showed its teeth, he fired. He aimed for the head, hitting more often than not. They were fast. Twice he was nearly overwhelmed while aiming, but managed to get help from one of the remaining guards. He saw that some of the prisoners were using weapons now. Perhaps they were homemade weapons, he couldn't tell. They were aiming for the heads, chopping and stabbing. More of the ghouls fell, but far more were being bitten. The group ran and ran. They were surrounded, and more and more of the ghouls were popping up in the places where they managed to shoot down another. Kettinger knew that his supply of ammo was running low, but he kept raising the weapon, aiming and firing. He was breathing hard. His chest felt like it was on fire. He couldn't take much more of this before a lack of ammo or sheer exhaustion took hold. One of the ghouls grabbed him from the right. Kettinger twisted and got his arm free. Then he kicked out with his right leg, sending the ghoul backwards into one of the guards that had yet to be changed. The ghoul seemed to change its mind and turn toward the guard. Kettinger raised the gun and put a bullet into the back of the thing's head. The guard returned the favor and blasted one of the ghouls that was leaping into the air behind Kettinger, about to land on his back. Everywhere that Kettinger turned was a fresh horror. Over to the right was a steaming pile of entrails. Over to the left was a severed arm, still twitching. Over in another direction was a prisoner with three of the ghouls biting down on a different section of his body. In another direction, a ghoul who had been blasted through the midsection and was now paralyzed from the waist down was still crawling forward, using its arms, teeth snapping at the air. Questions fired off in Kettinger's head. Where was Dalton? He had to keep Dalton safe. Where was Reg? 
Reg could not fall among their number. Both of them knew too much and were too dangerous to add to the hive mind. We're almost there. Kettinger dared to look up. They were near the door to the administration building. He heard fresh gunfire from the doorway of the admin building and more yelling. Ghouls fell and fell and fell. When Kettinger was able to get a clear view of things, he saw people dressed in shirts and ties, men and women, all firing weapons. Jenny was there, standing in the doorway, a rifle up against her shoulder. Kettinger pushed forward. Something grabbed his legs and he went sprawling, landing face first against the floor. He felt hands scrabbling over his legs, and then there was pressure against his ankle. Kettinger kicked out with his free leg and kicked something in the face. Kettinger rolled over, and there was a ghoul promptly crawling up his body, the sharp teeth snapping at the air. Kettinger got his arm up and punched the thing in the face, then he aimed his pistol and fired. Nothing happened. There was a click, but no bullet, no explosion of rotted brains. The ghoul seemed to realize this as well, and the thing cocked its head to the side as if studying Kettinger curiously. Then the head dodged forward, and the open black maw of the thing's mouth seemed huge, a mile wide. The teeth seemed huge, the ends of the teeth like sharp needles. He wondered what they would feel like as they tore him apart. He wondered what it would feel like to become part of the hive mind. Then there was gunfire, and the thing's head exploded into fragments. Kettinger looked up, and Jenny was there with the rifle. Kettinger got to his feet and ran. He stumbled, ran, skittered, and jumped. When he looked up, he saw that he was inside the administration building. Lock down, Kettinger yelled. Keep them out. Lock down. Kettinger ran to a panel on the wall. He opened the panel, punched in a number, and then placed his palm against a glass plate. Over at the doors, the soldiers in ties and skirts formed a line and kept firing into the throng of ghouls. An alarm went off. Red lights began to flash. Lockdown. 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 Over and over again, a mechanical female voice blared again and again. A loud rumbling shook the building. Huge metal panels slid down over every window, every door, every way to get in or out of the building. Lockdown. 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 Kettinger sank down to the floor, breathing hard, his head pounding. As the rumbling went on and on, over the sound of the doors closing was gunfire and a few screams. Then there was a huge thudding sound that seemed to vibrate the entire earth itself. Kettinger opened his eyes and saw the administration building bathed in the red light. The voice had stopped, but the interior was dark. Then generators kept inside the building kicked on. The lights brightened. Kettinger looked around. Prisoners who had been running were lying on the floor. They were near the massive loading back that they used to transfer men and machinery out into the hive itself. Guards lay there as well, side by side with the people they were supposed to be guarding. Outside the huge metal door, they could hear the snarling and the things out there scrambling and scrabbling over the door, trying to find a way in. Kettinger had initiated a lockdown that was meant to be an emergency-only protocol. Not even Q had the ability to do it. In fact, only he and Jenny could do it. That meant Q had no idea about it, had no way to know how to stop it, and had no way of knowing if there were any weak points. The problem was that they were now trapped inside. They had food and water for over a week, but they would run out eventually. Where's Reg? Kettinger asked, slowly getting to his feet. Dalton, are you here? He heard nothing but moans and breathing, mixed with sobbing for some time. Then two figures slowly got to their feet and came towards Kettinger. He breathed a sigh of relief. I'm here, boss, Reg said. The man looked pushed beyond the limits of exhaustion. I'm still among the living, Dalton King replied. Let's get a count, Kettinger said. How many are alive? You've been listening to When the Night Comes Out, The Hive. Tune in next time for The Hive, Part 11. Written by Brian W. Alaspa. Narrated and produced by Ali James. Music by Vivek Abhishek. Catch up on the first four seasons of When the Night Comes Out now. 
Support us on Patreon for more terrifying content.